Hello, and welcome to another video from 3.5 Archive. Today we're going to be looking at the top 10 monsters from the Monster Manual 5. This was the final Monster Manual released for D&D 3.5, and it was full of strange, terrifying, and innovative monsters. More so than any previous Monster Manual, it felt like it had a consistent tone and theme, one of a vaguely unsettling dark and weird fantasy menagerie. From the Mind Flayers of Thune, to the Mockery Bugs, to the Turbana, this monster manual had entire factions of related monsters that you could mix and match to build encounters, as well as standalone monsters like the Ember Guard and Gulvorg that helped to fill out existing factions and groups. The distinct feeling of this fifth and final monster manual would never be replicated in the remaining D&D 3.5 releases, or really in any future editions of the game, with the possible exception of the Elder Evil supplement that came out as a sort of epilogue to 3.5's publication history. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the 10 monsters that truly define this book's identity and made it worth owning. At number 10 we have the Ghoulvorg. These massive predatory beasts are bred for war by hobgoblin armies. At challenge rating 13 they're quite a bit above most hobgoblins and they make a great mount for elite goblinoid cavalry or the goblin general or simply as rampaging monsters traveling about on an old battlefield. It doesn't have a whole lot in the way of abilities beyond its boiling blood, which makes it costly to fight in melee as it burns whoever is slashing it, but it doesn't have a lot of hit points for its challenge rating, made up for by the fact that its attacks are fairly deadly. Overall, it's another great monster to keep goblinoid forces relevant at higher levels, not to mention the art is quite spectacular. At number 9 we have the Graveyard Sludge. This bizarre ooze is not an undead creature, but it is suffused with negative energy, and as such, it is healed by both positive and negative energy, which will make for an unpleasant surprise for clerics of either end of the alignment who choose to fight it with inflict spells or cure spells, or any sort of positive or negative energy. Creatures that die close by this ooze automatically rise as zombies a couple rounds after death, with slam attacks infused with acid. It can also release the spirits trapped within it as a fear attack, or bolster a nearby undead creature with damage reduction and turn resistance. With plenty of tactical options, a unique but flexible concept, and excellent art, the Graveyard Sludge is a great monster and can fit into almost any D&D dungeon. An interesting note, the art for this monster was reused for the Oblex monster in the 5e book Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, so it is unlikely that we will be seeing the Graveyard Sludge brought into 5th edition. At number 8 we have the Burrow Root. This plant creature lurks on the forest floor, laying inert just under the leaves before springing up to attack, leaving its foes bleeding from cursed wounds. It then retreats underground to drink the blood dripping from those creatures into the soil. Swarms of these can infest parts of the forest. Seeds of these creatures can make quite nasty booby traps, and one example encounter involves a harpy who has planted some in a small gully to trap passerby. Plant monsters are always welcome for fleshing out random encounter tables, or making up a druid's grove's defenders, and giving a battle to break up long travel through the wilderness. At number 7 we have the Frostwind Virago. This mysterious fey woman dwells in frozen mountain passes, often serving as an advisor to frost giants, but more often luring prey into the tower or other old ruins she occupies before killing and eating them, particularly humanoids. She can draw in prey with her siren-like song before summoning a fierce winter tempest to trap her foes and draining life's warmth from them with her touch. She's also able to fly for some reason. This fey creature is fairly straightforward in concept and adds to the sadly too short list of evil fey in D&D 3.5. At number 6 we have the Turbana. The various members of this vaguely insectoid group of creatures work together to lull entire villages into sleep before feeding on them. These creatures spread as a plague across the countryside, from the mosquito-like eye wings that weaken their opponent's mental resolve with a touch, leaving them more vulnerable to the sleep spells of these stag beetle-like drowsers, and those who refuse to fall asleep are subjected to the Turbana Slayer and Spawner, who have a more straightforward approach to subduing their prey. These creatures make for a good side threat in a campaign, and their origin can either remain mysterious or turn out to be one of purposeful creation for some sort of nefarious plot. They are similar to the Formians, yet different in style and more feral and basic in their desires. At number 5 we have the Deadborn Vulture. These giant vultures rise as zombies once killed, essentially making them two monsters in one. These creatures are infused with negative energy, the seed of undeath already planted within them from birth. 
Killing one of them is just the beginning. While this creature might be less effective in its zombie form, it does have far more hit points and a disease that taints its claws, becoming far more virulent. It is one of the few examples of a monster with different stages, so to speak, in D&D. And it is an interesting concept and can make for an unsettling moment for your characters when the monster they killed proceeds to stagger back to its feet and begin the fight anew. These vultures make great mounts for necromancers, blackguards, and other evil creatures. At number four, we have the Bridge Haunt. This spirit is one of a group of haunts that uh, occupy a particular area and to be permanently dispelled or laid to rest, uh, some sort of goal needs to be fulfilled. This spirit occupies the area around a bridge and is bound by it. It can only truly be destroyed when the body of the creature it formed from is properly laid to rest, usually somebody that drowned or died falling off the bridge, uh, or some other dying wish is fulfilled. They are a fun encounter for a traveling party, no matter how much the characters choose to interact with them, whether it's simply you know, talking to them as they pass by, or perhaps the bridge haunt lures them into its trap and attempts to shove them off the bridge. Uh, a bridge haunt can even provide a recurring antagonist of sorts if the characters do not fully deal with the haunt on their first time crossing a bridge. Bridge haunts can appear to be real people, which they use to deceive their prey into letting themselves be caught in a vulnerable position, or the haunt can use its incorporeal touch to shove them off the bridge to their deaths. It can also use mass suggestion should normal means of deception fail. This section also provides several example haunt characters for groups to encounter, with a fleshed out backstory and the like. At number three, we have the Sola Myth. This is one of the creatures from the screensaver for the Monster Manual 5. This corpulent demon's belly pulses with the screaming faces of souls trapped within, which it can tear free and hurl at foes as fireballs. It's surprisingly fast despite its bulky form, and it has an interesting mechanic in which it sacrifices some of its hit points to use its soul fire ability to hurl those fireballs, and it can choose to sacrifice more hit points to widen the radius of its fireball, or to maximize its damage, or both. This can give a dungeon master a lot of interesting tactical choices. With fast healing 5, this becomes an option for the monster to skirmish with the party from the shadows, as other demons engage them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. These demons are a manifestation of gluttony and enjoy consuming and imprisoning lesser spirits. At number 2, we have the Turlamoy. This is one of the Ushamoy. This massive creature looks like a walking muscular anatomy diagram. Its freakish appearance is only worsened as it is damaged, and its muscular fibers fuse into a swollen but smooth crimson skin. Like all of the Ushamoy, it gains bonuses each time it experiences some sort of stimuli, and in this case that stimuli is damage. Whenever it's damaged, it gets plus 1 to hit, plus 2 to its damage rolls, and plus 2 to armor class, to a maximum of plus 5 to hit and plus 10 to damage and armor class. The concept of a monster that grows stronger as you fight it is intriguing, and encourages players to focus on delivering a few decisive blows rather than wearing it down with death by a thousand cuts. The Ushimoi are an odd collection of variations on a single race, with a slave cast, assassin cast, noble cast, and brute cast put together for an easy hierarchy that still affords a dungeon master a lot of freedom in deciding how these strange humanoids fit into his world. And at number one we have the Mad Crafter of Thune. This horrifying looking monster is one of the scariest ever printed. It's not even clear from looking at it what creature it is supposed to be formed from. Its very existence looks to be painful, its maw kept propped open by a metal cone serving as a birth canal for bizarre, quintessence-infused constructs. It's a challenge rating 10 creature that summons challenge rating 5 and 6 monsters to fill the battlefield. It spews out these monsters and leaves them surrounded by caustic acid to burn opponents who rush to attack them. This is a monster that really lets you use your battle mat to its fullest extent if you use one. It also has a Mind Blast, like Mind Flayers do, to clear a path for its minions to attack. While this isn't the most powerful monster, and it relies a lot on its minions to do its dirty work, it is another interesting concept and the terrifying art is worth showing to the players, as it is hard for its description to do it justice. Imagining this creature slowly slithering through a demented Alithid laboratory should be enough to unnerve even the toughest of adventurers. So, that's it for the top 10 monsters from the Monster Manual 5. At some point, there will be videos for the top 10 monsters from the other monster manuals, as well as some top 10 spells, feats of different classes and from various supplements, and other of the like, along with more prestige class reviews. So, that's going to be it for this video. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, and so on. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time here on 3.5 Archive.